What's up, everybody in the room? Everybody tuning in on a welcome Ports Live locations, Ports Indy, Ports Greater Lafayette, Des Moines, Cincy, Midland, wherever you are tuning in from, and of course, Dallas, Texas, the home of the Dallas Mavericks, about to launch the greatest comeback in NBA history. It's happening, man. Luca's going off 42. You'll see it after tonight. Okay, hey, we're continuing the series. Point of view, if you were just joining us, we are in a series where we are looking at the point of view of people who interacted with the Son of God when he was on the planet. And tonight we're gonna to continue. And let me ask a question to set up where we're gonna be going tonight. What is the best movie soundtrack of all time? Parent, parent, parent trap? It is definitely not the parent trap, that is for sure. Tarzan, what else? What? La La Land. All right. Lion King. I don't know which one it is for you. It is definitely not the parent trap though. I'm gonna reiterate that. I think arguably, at least in the top five, you've gotta put Lion King in there. Probably Tarzan, maybe over one, but. My kids recently, I've got six-year-old, about to be four-year-old, and uh, four-month-old. And with our older two, of course, Disney is just, you just live and breathe it. And so we go back and we watch the Disney movies that I grew up on as a kid, and one of those being Lion King. And recently we watched Lion King, and I don't remember, I don't know if you, you've seen it or you remember the plot. I'm about to spoil it, but you're 25 years late, so I don't care. <laughs> Anyways, in the plot, you know, Simba, he's born, he's got Mufasa, and eventually that evil Uncle Scar sets this thing up. Simba ends up being a part of uh, seeing his dad die and he runs off to live with Timon and Pumbaa and eat bugs. Eventually the monkey shows up and he sees his dad in the sky and he goes back, defeats Scar, wins the setup. Now my kids are seeing this and recently watched it for the first time and of course they're gonna latch on to the music and so whenever we drive around they wanna listen to Disney soundtracks of music. So it's Tarzan, Lion King and recently they were singing and they had just watched the movie and they were singing in the car this past Wednesday. We're just jamming out and they're singing, I just can't wait to be king, as you do. And eventually my six-year-old and my four-year-old are sitting there and we're singing it and driving in the car and my six-year-old goes, wait, why does he wanna be king when he's younger, but when he gets older, he doesn't wanna be king anymore? And we just entered into this serious conversation and I, uh, before I get to answer it, my four-year-old, if she's three and a month, she'll be four, and she is at that stage where she can't pronounce her R's and yet she thinks she knows everything in the world, so she's like to her brother, Crew, 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 he doesn't wanna be king because he wants to be with Timon and Pumbaa. And it's like, no, that's not it. Yeah, he wants to be with Timon and Pumbaa eating the bugs. And it's like, no, that's not why he doesn't want to be king. And I'm trying to figure out how to articulate that Simba carries this shame that he blames himself for, for his dad. And that leads him to run away and try to run from his problems. And we're in this conversation. And what's ironic or interesting about it is in so many ways, that encounter with Someone experiencing shame, regret, remorse, blame, and it leading to them running or seeking to escape from the problems in their past or the problems that they have is, it's a common human experience. In other words, this is a lesson they're learning at you know, six and four, but they're gonna be exposed to people that do this for the rest of their life that may even be something they do in their life. And what does that have to do with what we're gonna talk about tonight? We're gonna to look at a story that involves someone who was covered in shame and see how Jesus deals with it, brings healing to it. And my hope, because I, I think about that story and candidly, I think inside of this room, that some of you guys, you carry shame and regret and remorse over things that you've been carrying for decades. And as I was preparing this message and just thinking through the text that we're gonna look at, it, my hope and prayer is that some of us would leave and just the weight of shame that we're carrying would be lifted. Maybe it's shame from not even something you chose to do, it was done to you, form of abuse. 
Maybe it's shame in your relationship with God. And if you were honest, you feel like every time you go to pray, you're just flooded with all of the different sin in your past or maybe your present. Maybe it's shame from an eating disorder that no one knows. And everything looks normal on the outside, but you know, and when you're all alone and you're staring at the ceiling, it just, it haunts you. Maybe it's a decision in your past from some sexual experience that you never thought that would be a part of your story, but it is, and, and it is something you carry with you every day. And what you're gonna discover and I'm gonna discover is that Jesus wants to meet us in that and help us experience freedom from that. And so we're gonna look briefly at a story in John chapter 21, and it involves Jesus being seen through the point of view of the most famous of all the disciples, Peter. And it's in a moment where Peter is carrying tremendous shame from arguably the worst failure in the New Testament, where he had abandoned and denied this guy that he'd followed for years and that he promised he would never abandon. He would go to his death for, go to prison for. And yet he didn't, and he's now carrying this shame. And Jesus has died and resurrected, and he's even appeared to the disciples. That happened in John 20. We don't have time to go into it, but he's, he's ascended. He's back alive, and he shows up to the guys. And then Jesus goes off again, and Peter and the disciples are wondering, like, is God done with us? All of us abandoned him in a worst hour of need. And so we're going to look at four brief takeaways from this story, and then we're going to walk through. And I believe God wants to set some people free tonight and lead a life where you're not gonna carry, you can clap for that, you're not gonna carry for the rest of your life what he carried. All right, this is just getting weird now, okay? (laughs) So let me, uh, let me, (laughs) y'all are out of control, man. All right, John chapter 21, but before I go there, I'm gonna read John chapter 20 because, thank you, John chapter 20, Because it's a really interesting take, the way that chapter 20 ends, it's as though the book is over, and yet John introduces an entire new chapter afterwards. In other words, let me read this. This is the end of John chapter 20, where it says this in verse 30. At the very end, you would think the book is over. Now Jesus did many other signs in his presence, or in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, everything I just talked about the last 20 chapters, are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Now that is a great ending. And it's as though John is like, oh man, through the Spirit of God inspired, oh, there's one more story I need to write. Because there's some unfinished business related to Jesus and the leader of the disciples, who is Peter. And he launches into this interaction that would forever change the church in general and Peter and his ministry in life. And he, John knows this and he launches into that story. He says this in verse one. After this, this being the resurrection, Jesus appearing, Thomas, you know, stick your hands, see my uh, scars. Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Now Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other disciples were together. So there's seven total out of the 11, because there's not 12 disciples, now there's 11, because Judas is out, and he drops James and John, and Nathaniel, and Peter, and Thomas, and then perhaps the greatest, uh, like, you know that moment where somebody has a picture and they tag everybody in the friend group except for you, and you're on social media, and you're like, what the heck, man? This is probably the greatest example of that of all time because it's eternal and that he says there was James and John and there were these two other guys that don't even get mentioned. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. And he called out to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. 
He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And so they cast it. And they were not able to bring in the net because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, which is how John describes himself over and over in his book. You gotta love it. Therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea to begin to swim towards the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from land, about 100 yards off. The first thing I wanna highlight is how Jesus runs towards us in our shame. Jesus runs towards us in our shame. So what just happened? The disciples are there, and Peter says, I'm going fishing. Now, Jesus had said, I'm gonna meet you on a mountain near Galilee. And Peter's not at the mountain, and he's certainly not where he's supposed to be because he's carrying all this shame from a decision that he had made. This is about three weeks after Jesus was crucified. And on the night before Jesus was crucified, he had his boys together and he had what we call the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, he sits down, they have this meal. And during the conversation, Jesus says, every one of you will abandon me. It's been written that God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Jesus says, you're all gonna abandon. And Peter stands up and he says, in several different accounts, but in Luke 22, he said, Lord, I'm ready to go, Luke 22, verse 33 and 34, I'm ready to go to prison, even death with you. In another version, or in Mark's point of view, he says, even if all of these guys abandon you, I never will. And Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, The rooster will not crow this day until you deny me. You deny three times that you even know me. And Peter goes, there's no way. They finish the meal, they go out to pray in this garden. All of a sudden, Judas shows up with this temple guard group and they arrest Jesus. And they take him away and they lead him and they put him on trial. And Peter, we're told, follows at a distance that he's watching and he's waiting to see what's gonna happen. And he shows up and Jesus is brought to the high priest's house and he's put on trial there. And Peter follows and basically walks outside the courtyard to watch and see what's gonna happen. In Luke 22, it tells us this. They seized Jesus and they led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire, a charcoal fire, In the middle of the courtyard and sat down, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man was also with Jesus. But Peter denied it, saying, woman, I I don't know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you you were one of them. And Peter said, man, I'm not. Not one of Jesus' followers. After an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man was also with him. He's a Galilean. Peter's accent, we're told in another account, had given him away. And Peter begins to call down curses on Jesus, basically to reflect, would someone who knows him curse him like this? And it says, man, I do not know what you're talking about, Peter said. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned from inside the courtyard and he looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Shortly after Jesus is led away, he's crucified. He's buried and three days later he rises. Like I said, he showed up and he appeared to all the disciples, but Peter's still covered in shame Over in Jesus' worst moment in life, I denied even knowing him. The man that I'd followed for three years, I saw him allow blind people to see. I saw him feed 5,000 people with a Lunchable. I saw him allow people to walk again who'd been lame their entire life. And then after three years and hours after saying, I'll die for you, to a middle school girl and two other men, Peter says, I've never even seen the man before. And he's covered in shame and he's wondering what a lot of us want when our shame hits us. Like, is God, does God want anything to do with me? Is God done with me? He's back alive, but I don't know if he wants me back at all. 
In Mark 16, we're even told that when the angels announce Jesus' resurrection, Mary Magdalene, these Marys, they show up on the third day, Sunday, Easter. They go to the tomb, it's empty. There's an angel there. And the angel says, he's not here, he's alive. Jesus is alive. Go tell the disciples and Peter that he's coming to meet them. Now, why would he say, and Peter? He is a disciple. Maybe because he knew that Peter wouldn't have come had they not said, and Peter. But Peter thinks, man, I'm going to go back to what I know. I'm going fishing. It had been three years since Peter had been out fishing. And the day that Jesus showed up and he said, I'm going to change you from fishing in the sea to being a fisher of men. And Peter goes out and decides, I'm going back. That's a curveball. (laughs) This is all for effect. (laughs) And it was a dark and stormy night. (laughs) And behold, Jesus. Um, Should we just go movie style or throw the Mavs game on or what? We're still live on video. So if you're tuning in, man, that's creepy. But... um, Wait, anything else you should know? Are these going to be down? They'll be down for about four minutes. Four minutes? <laughs> this is great, man. All right. We're back to old school tent revivals, okay? So Peter is wondering, does Jesus want anything to do with me? And all of us have been in a moment where, man, shame can drive us from God. It's one of the key things that ends up happening in people's life. A lot of you guys grew up in church and you ended up losing your virginity at some point in high school and making one mistake after the next, after the next, and you've just been running ever since. And you showed up at 25 here and you had a relationship with God and you're trying to get back in the relationship you had, but you've been running because when you are honest with yourself, it's just shame, guilt that you're carrying. And Peter's in that moment where he's going, I don't know that God wants anything to do with me. And so he's going out fishing. And Jesus shows Peter, you think this is about you? You think that my relationship with you is dependent on your faithfulness to me? No, Peter, I'm not done with you. He shows up on the shore, performs a miracle that I'll highlight again, just like the miracle the day that he called Peter to come follow him in Luke 5. And Peter, wrapped up in love, jumps into the water and swims towards Jesus. But I just want to highlight, I mean, Peter, he ran from God to go fishing. But shame can lead us to run from God in all kinds of ways. Shame is the reason why some of us, when you think about dating someone, you hear us talk about dating relationships all the time at the porch, and we describe, hey, this is the person to look for, and this is the type of way you should date, and this is who you should seek to be. And let me just be blunt. A lot of you guys think, Man, dude, I don't know what fantasy world he lives in, but I've never met anybody like that. And anybody that is like that, godly guy or godly girl, they don't want anything to do with me. And you see yourself as damaged goods because you carry shame from sexual sin, from dysfunctional relationships. And it's led you to settle. Because you think, man, whatever they're describing, that, I'm not a good enough person to have that kind of thing. And shame can lead us to run from relationships and our past, just run from relationships in general. I can't believe that I did that. And shame is having tremendous power over a lot of our lives. And for Peter, it like, like him turning and running from God's call. Shame can lead us to not be willing to share our faith because I'm going, man, I'm just a hypocrite. These friends, they know I could share like God is working in my life, but I would be sharing with these friends and they just know me. They know my story and I'm too ashamed. Shame is why, candidly, some of you guys are not serving and using your gifts and being a part of leading the next generation and serving in younger ministries because you feel like you're, you're not good enough. And it's shame. And Jesus shows up on that shore to showcase to Peter and to you, I pursue those who are shamed 
who should be ashamed and who are covered in shame. And I want to change that, Peter. And Peter experiences it. Shame is the reason often we run. It's been that way since the beginning, since Genesis chapter 3. You know what happened in Genesis chapter 3? Adam and Eve, they eat the apple, and then it says that they ran and hid. And God called out to them and pursued them. He said, Adam and Eve, where are you? And they said, we were ashamed. And so we ran and hid. What's interesting is our natural inclination when we feel shame over, you know, a substance addiction, pornography that you promised you'd never go back to, crossing those physical boundaries you said you never would, giving into a same-sex attraction you're terrified somebody's gonna find out with, and our natural inclination is to run from God, and I'm just gonna avoid it, and I'm gonna run away. And What's interesting is God's inclination, ours is to run from him, his is to run towards us. And he did so with Adam and Eve, and he does so here with Peter. And he shows up and says, I'm not done with you, because Jesus runs towards us. My daughter, often because she is like three or almost four, and she's one of the least coordinated individuals I've ever seen. So she'll be walking along like she's Captain Jack Sparrow or something, and she will eventually, she'll just fall, and it happens like seven times a day. And she'll fall down, and she'll begin to cry, and she's at that stage where she wants everything to be kissed because that makes it better. And so I run to her when she falls, and then I pick her up, and all better. Now my heart is not that she would continue to fall, but my heart is also not, hey, come on, what are you gonna do? You're four, you should have known this already. You should be able to walk. Why, because I love my daughter. Now let me ask you this. The Bible says God is familiar with your everything, your sin nature, the family of origin that you have, all the different ways that the temptations you struggle with came about, the addictions that have marked your life, the broken family you were raised in, the heartbreak you have felt. Do you think the way I love my daughter, even when she falls and I run towards her to pick her up, do you think God's capacity for love and care for you when you fall, spiritually, sexually, in any way, do you think I have more love for my daughter than God, eternal, perfect, holy Father has for you? He's going, Peter, this has never been about you, man. And you're covered in shame. and You think that if only you had behaved, you would be worthy. You've never been worthy. But I run towards those who are ashamed and who are covered in shame to show them my love. And my guess is, and I'm gonna move to the next point, all the other three are very quick. My guess is something is beginning to click with Peter. Why do I say that? Here's what's ironic. If you've read the Bible, you know this story feels eerily similar to another story that happened. I referenced it a second ago. In Luke chapter five, it's the very first day Peter and Jesus ever meet. Jesus shows up, huge crowds. He can't project all of them, so he says, hey, Pete, I need to get in your boat. He gets in Peter's boat with him, and they go out a little bit off the water. Jesus teaches the crowds. At the end of the sermon, Jesus says, put your net in. Peter says, Jesus, we, we've been fishing all night, bro. Like, uh, this is kind of what I do for a living, and we didn't catch anything. And he's like, well, try the other side. Well, I don't know if you know this, but fish, it's like they could, it's not gonna be there just because it wasn't here. It doesn't work that way, but all right. And he throws it in, and all of a sudden, they get a catch that's so big, the boat begins to sink. Very similar, with one difference, one huge difference. In that moment, Peter throws himself to his knees and says, you need to go. I'm not a good person. You, you, you need to get away from me. And he realizes I'm in the presence of something and someone divine and I am not a good person. It says this in Luke chapter five. And he fell down, Peter, and said, depart from me. I am a sinful man, Lord. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching or fishing for men. The same incidence happens again, same miracle. But this time, Peter doesn't fall on his knees and say, please get away from me. He dives in the water and moves towards Jesus as though it's beginning to click that God pursues the broken and the ashamed. It's almost hilarious. Peter is clearly one of those like, you know, 
ready, shoot, aim kind of people because he throws his shirt on, he dumps in the water, and the text reads as though like the disciples were like, we were actually really close, but for some reason Peter just wanted to get in and swim towards him. It didn't make any logical sense. They're like, all right, just let him go. Let him keep going. And they get to the shore, likely even before Peter. But Peter was doing what you do when you're in love. You're not thinking. You're just like, man, he's, he's here. He's not done with me. And if you tune me out for the rest of the time, here's what I want you to walk away with. He's not done with you. No matter what your story is, no matter what you think has put you beyond what God wants to do in your life, that his love, his grace, himself, he's not done with you. He wants more for you than you want for you. And Peter's seeing all of that firsthand. All right, I'm gonna keep moving. Verse 20, or verse nine. When they got to the land, they saw a charcoal fire. That's really important, we're gonna come back to that with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So I got pita bread and fish, first fish tacos right here. So Simon went aboard and he hauled the net full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said, you guys come have breakfast. And they're sitting there at breakfast. And verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus begins to have a conversation with Simon Peter. And we discover later in verses that we're not gonna get to that they end up going on a walk together, just the two of them. The reason I know that is because at the end of the verse or at the end of the chapter, we're told that they're having this conversation and at one point, Peter looks back and John has been following them the entire time. He's like, what is he doing? And so they're in this conversation walking together and Jesus begins to ask a series of questions. And he says this, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? disciples. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it a third time. Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now there's two things remarkable Jesus is doing here. And I wanna pull these two points out of this text very quickly. The first is that Jesus is doing what he does for anyone who knows him. Jesus redeems our past. Why do I say that? Here's what just happened with Peter. He shows up on the beach, charcoal fire. Sits down, has a conversation, Jesus wants him to say it three times. Do you know the only other occasion in all of the New Testament where there is a charcoal fire? There's a lot of fires mentioned in the Bible. There's only two charcoal fires ever mentioned. Here, and that night, where Peter sat around warming himself and denied the Son of God. Sense is one of the strongest, or the sense of smell is one of the strongest attachments to association of memories that we have. It's been said to be stronger than any of the other senses. And Jesus is going to redeem his past and recreate the moment of his betrayal and denial and say, I'm not done with you. And sitting around that charcoal fire, he says, Peter, do you love me? And there were three denials And now he's saying three affirmations because Jesus redeems. What does redeem mean? It means to purchase, to exchange. And he's exchanging. Hey, that doesn't define you anymore. I define you. Your relationship with me is now what defines you. He says, do you love me more than these? Speaking about the other disciples. Because Peter, remember, was the guy who said, if everybody else doesn't follow you, I will to my death. And Peter is having all of that Tragic failure replaced. And Jesus is saying, that doesn't define you anymore because I am a God who redeems your past. Where I relate to Peter, and maybe you can relate too, is this feeling of like, man, I just, I'm, I, I've, I'm disappointing God again. Like he looks at my life and he's like, man, you should be a better leader. You should be a better father. 
You should be a better husband. You should be a nicer person. You should be more generous. You should be a better just individual member of the church. And I can begin to think like, man, God, he's just disappointed or he wishes I would try a little harder or I'm just kind of letting him down. And Peter's confronted with all of that. I'm sure God, when he looks at me, is, is disappointed in me. And he's discovering, you didn't disappoint me, Peter. I told you this was gonna happen. You didn't let me down and surprise me because I'm God and I'm what's called omniscient. What does omniscient mean? It means I know everything. Peter, before you denied me, I told you you were going to deny me. Like you brought this idea that, oh, I'm surprised and I didn't know about that and now you're really disappointed. He knows all of that. He knows all of Peter's story and he knows all of your story. He knows every sin that is in front of you you don't even know you're gonna commit. And he doesn't want that just like any loving father doesn't want anything that's gonna harm their children. And yet that doesn't move him away from you. That's the point of the gospel. That's why he moves towards you. He didn't disappoint me. He knows everything you have ever done, ever thought, every sin that you don't even realize was sin. And he moves towards you, just like he did here with Peter. And he replaces and redeems that past. And he's going to say, you're not defined by that anymore. In fact, I'm going to recreate all of that experience and give a new memory in its place. Because I'm a God who redeems your past. I exchange it for something so much better. My son recently lost his first tooth. And so we are tooth fairy people. If you're not a tooth fairy person, you do you, don't judge me. Most of you guys don't have kids anyway, so get off me. Anyways, he uh, had his first tooth loss, and so we were like, oh, we're going to do the thing where you put the tooth underneath the pillow, and then, you know, you put cash there, which now as a parent, you realize that your parents, there was no formula to this. It basically was like, how much do you have in your wallet? Do you have any cash? Do you have any cash? So, uh, you know, he gets five bucks, because that's all I had. And so I put it under the thing, and I get the tooth. Now, what else you don't realize, because most of you guys haven't lost teeth in a while, is how disgusting a baby tooth is. It's just a very like, this, what am I going to do with this thing? It's just going to go in the trash. And I just gave $5 in exchange for this, this nasty little thing that was clearly not brushed enough. And we're just going to throw it away. And this exchange of something good for something gross. And in a parallel way, and in a very serious way, that's what the gospel is. It is God saying, you bring your sin, you bring all the decisions that mark your past, all the shame, all the guilt, everything you've ever done, and I take all of those, and you get the glory and the righteousness of Jesus himself. The exchange of something gross and exchange for something great. And he's saying, Peter, this this is what the whole message is. It's not about you. I pursue you in your shame and I redeem you from your past. And then we see something else that he begins to lay out in that conversation. He he restores his purpose. He's like, Peter, I'm not done with you. I want you to feed my sheep. What's that mean? Tend to my lambs. He's describing the church and he's saying, Peter, I want you to lead the church. I want you to teach. I want you to pour into. I want you to share the gospel and be a part of leading. That's what he's saying with the sheep metaphor that Jesus uses to describe his followers. I want you to lead, Peter. I'm not just done with your past or changing it. I'm restoring your purpose. The third idea is Jesus restores our purpose. I want you to feed my lambs. Care for those young in the faith. Tend to my sheep. Care for those who are part of the faith. Eventually, this clicked because Peter went from the coward to courageous. And he went from Peter, who was going fishing, to leading the church and getting over that shame. Had that not happened... Peter, three weeks later, is gonna go and at Pentecost, which is the launching of the church, he's gonna preach and lead the message and 3,000 people are gonna come to know Jesus, all flowing from this moment that Jesus looks in his eyes and he says, I'm not done with you. All the, no one in this room has denied the Son of God after walking personally with him for three years. And if Jesus was not done with Peter, if he's not done with me, he's not done with you, no matter what story you have. And he wants to restore your purpose. He wants to give purpose to your life. And he looks at Peter and he says, man, I'm not done with you. And there's a world that is hurting and broken. And I want to restore you to your purpose. I broke my hand about a year ago. 
something interesting happens when you break a bone. It grows back stronger. And whatever brokenness is in your life and in my life, maybe it is from past decisions that you made, whatever your story is, God wants to take that and heal it and make it not just a source that formerly was broken and hurt, addicted, but something far stronger and greater and use that part of your story to minister to others all the time. You know what the best ministers to people who struggle with an abortion in their past are? Women who have that in their story. There's a ministry called Worthmore, all led by women at this church who've had that as a part of their story. Some of the best ministers that I know of as it relates to pornography being in their story, like it is mine, to care and help and come alongside and encourage men who are battling against, or women and men who are battling against lustful thoughts are men who have that a part of your story. God wants to take that and fuse it and make it stronger, not weaker. And he restores Peter and he restores purpose to him. And the final observation, we see this, verse 18. Truly I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and you would walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you to where you do not want to go. This he said to show what kind of death Peter would glorify God by. And after saying this, he said to him, follow Me. It's a really interesting thing that he just shared. He said, Peter, when you were young, you used to dress and you go wherever you want. There's going to come a day, a few decades from now, where somebody else is going to lead you where you don't want to go. And you're going to stretch out your arms, and that's going to be how you die. The fourth idea we see is Jesus redefines our future. Now, let me explain. He just told Peter, three weeks ago, you denied me because you were afraid to die. You looked death in the face and you were afraid to die for knowing me, for your faith in me, and so you ran from it, you denied me, but there will come a day where you will be willing to look death in the face and you will go all in and say, whatever the cost, he's worth it. And you will die for me, Peter. And you will go on to lead the church like no other person other than Jesus ever has. Church history tells us that Jesus did rewrite his story. In other words, the coward becomes courageous. Why do I say that? Because eventually his hands would be stretched out, which is a metaphor for crucifixion, and Peter would be crucified. But in the face of that crucifixion, Peter, at the last moment, said, don't do it upside. I am not worthy to die like my savior. Turn me upside down. And he was crucified as blood rushed to his head upside down for his faith in the Messiah he had denied. And Jesus says, your story is going to be rewritten, Peter. And you won't be known as Peter the coward. You for my sake will be willing to go whatever the cost. I know him, I love him, and I will follow him. I wanna transition and invite you to do something tonight. You were handed a sheet of paper, an index card on the way in, and I want you to take that out, and I want you to write something on it. And I wanna be very specific about what I want you to write. We did something like this a few months ago, And yet there are a lot of us that are either new or we're picking up and we're carrying things that if we're being honest, they seep into how we think God thinks about us. And I want you to write on that card the thing that you feel shame and you feel guilt for, you feel like it defines you. The thing that maybe right now you don't even wanna write because the person next to you doesn't even know that's a part of your story and you're afraid to. And I want you to write it out and invite you to go at Whatever point you're ready to go and drop it off at any of the bins and say, I'm, not, I'm done with this. This doesn't define me anymore. Because here's the truth. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have trusted as Jesus as the payment for your sin, his death and resurrection, it doesn't define you anymore. You can have an affair tomorrow with somebody who's married and it doesn't define you. You know what does? If you are in Jesus, you are forgiven, you are clean, you are healed, you are free, you are new. That's what defines you for the rest of your life. Listen to me very closely. For the rest of your life, 
in the face of falling for temptation. God doesn't want any more than I want my kids to fall down, but that doesn't make her not my kid. You are no longer defined by that. If you are in Jesus, a lot of you are not in Jesus, which means you are defined by those things. But for those of us are, you've been invited by God. I'm going to write this out. This doesn't define me. I carry this shame. I carry this weight and I carry it with me in life. And I'm deciding I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to look the savior in the eyes, the same savior that showed up to Peter and said, this doesn't define you. I'm a God who chases after you in spite of all the sin in your life. And I'm going to redefine your past and I am redefining your future. I've got more for you and I'm going to give you purpose. And some of you guys won't do it. Some of you guys are going to write something that's honestly not even what you struggle with. But some of you are going to experience freedom. There's nothing magic in paper, but it's deciding this doesn't define me anymore. I'm done, and I may struggle for the rest of my life, but I'm not gonna buy the lie that those struggles define me, because he does. And the band will come out here in a second, and we'll have a chance. But right now, wherever you're at, as they play, just wanna invite you to write it out, whatever that is. And our team this week is gonna go around, you don't have to put your name, we just wanna pray over it, and you know what, here's what we're gonna pray. God, would you give them freedom from this? Will they believe that you are who you say you are? And you have done what you did, and you have done what you've said is accomplished. It is finished. And then we'll have a chance to close out. But there's been spread all throughout the room. If you're in the balcony, there's some up there, there's some down here, there's some over here, there's some back there. And you just, whenever you're ready, man, I'm done.
it's um, funny, I started with telling you kind of the plot of Lion King. And if you remember, like the turning point for when he comes back, as silly as it was, or silly as it is, even to talk about Disney movies, is he's told to remember. Remember. Remember who you are. And something shifts. And in a much more real and true way, for the rest of your life, my hope is that when you fail, you fall when I fall because there's no perfect people on this stage it's just sinful broken people holding on to Jesus you remember who you are and what defines you which is Jesus and when temptation comes to tell you you are damaged messed up and how could you you remember the Savior who runs after the shameful, who redefines our past, who gives us purpose in this life, and is redefining and rewriting your story and mine. Remember who he says that you are, which is the most true reality about who you are. Forgiven, clean, new, alive, forever his. And that never changes. For those who are in Christ, let me pray. Father, I thank you that you have done what only you can do, which is allow dead people to be made alive, spiritually speaking, by your spirit. Thank you that many of us have allowed Jesus and his work on the cross to be accepted in our life as the payment for our sin. His resurrection of, from the grave is proof of that payment. And so would anyone who's never made that decision tonight be their night? Father, would you allow us to live lives that are free from shame and regret and guilt and all the different things that fight for our attention and push us away from you. And would we believe what you say about us and would we run to you, the Father who has since the moment we were born in this life until the moment we leave it has been running towards us. We worship you now in song, amen.